I talked about, remember, going back to three components of uh, uh, LCOE, the cost, efficiency, and uh, energy yield. So this is the efficiency part. I'll talk about it in more detail uh, in a second. But let me just, I know it's kind of simplistic. What is efficiency, right? But actually, you'd be surprised. Let me just go over, over that in a second. And uh, so it's total electrical power out, electrical power, at the maximum power point in a solar cell curve under one sun normalized intensity, OK? And one sun intensity, as I defined before, is 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared. Um, so people interchangeably use e efficiency and power. Why? Because you can see, for example, if you have 20 milliwatts per centimeter squared electrical power, and then you have to normalize by 100 milliwatts, so the efficiency is 20%. Because the normalization factor is 100, in units of uh, milliwatts per centimeter squared, the numerical value of efficiency is same as electrical power. That's why it's interchangeable, right? And I already talked about the powerful LCOE knob because it cuts across the entire supply chain, OK? So this is a typical curve, IV curve of a solar cell. On the top, ignore the red curve. Um, I'll talk about it later. But you look at the corresponding power curve. What is the power curve? It's the product of x and y axis, which is power is voltage times current. So you can see that at zero voltage, obviously, the power is zero. At zero current, the power is zero. And it peaks somewhere in the middle. That's the point that you want to bias your solar cell to to extract the maximum power out of it. Right? And how do you bias it? Uh, you bias it by having a load and adjusting the load uh, such that uh, you always track it at this particular point, right? And now let's go to the red curve. Red curve corresponds to where, suppose it's cloudy, right? So the illumination dropped. And as illumination dropped, your maximum power point changed. So if you're still biased at this point, you're not reaping the best benefits out of that. So there is electronic chips which actually go in the modules, which are called MPPT, maximum power point trackers. And these are little uh, integrated circuits, essentially, which, whose only job is to constantly look at the illumination and, and bias it at the maximum power point. Okay. So uh, typical efficiencies, now I talked about what is efficiency. Typical efficiencies, be careful. Every time we talk about efficiency, you will actually floor someone if, you actually, if they tell you an efficiency number, ask for the area, right? People make coupons, these are tiny, 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 and claim the efficiencies which are really, really high. Right? And uh, that's, it's a big deal, but it's not as big a deal as to make it a large area. So never believe anybody if they don't tell area with their efficiency. Right? So when I say this essentially in manufacturing on large areas, these are typical values that you see for different material sets. So for monocrystal and silicon, it's 19 to 24%. That's the mainstream. If you were actually had a multicrystalline cell, it's 18 to 20.5. Uh, what are called thin silicon, which is CIGS or cadmium telluride, it's 11 to 14 percent range. Gallium arsenide single junction is 26 to 28. And tandem cells, depending on tandem cells, are multiple junctions stacked together. Uh, depending on the number of junctions you have, for example, three junctions is 43 and a half. And I think I, I believe the next, yeah, go ahead. So the tandem cells are usually in place for, uh, right. 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 So, actually, when I was saying large areas, I meant particularly for silicon. Uh, but you're right that the in the in the concentrator cells, the idea is actually uh, to kind of virtually create a large area by putting a concentrator on. Right. So it's not fair to compare gallium arsenide. But gallium arsenide technology is the it has different issues. Uh, it's actually you think about that. It's it's really interesting. Gallium arsenide is one of the most uh, efficient absorbers, right? You know, so you can absorb all that it can absorb because the direct band gap falls, the absorption falls really rapidly within about one to two microns, right? When you have 150 microns or 100 microns thick gallium arsenide, what you're doing is really dumb. You're you're actually supporting two microns of active material with 148 microns of really expensive material. Because that's the only purpose of that thick layer, is to support mechanically. So one of the ideas that uh, uh, 
that Eli Ivlanovich might have talked about with Alta devices was actually to reuse that mechanical support, where you only need the active layers to be two microns thick, right? So uh, that makes it cheaper, the mechanical support. Anyway, that's a little divergence in front of what you're asking. So, But I, I, what I was referring to when I was talking about the area is essentially that um, you know, uh, there are lots of reports. For example, the, the highest efficiency cell in the world uh, for silicon is 25.5, I believe, uh, from uh, UNSW, which is in Australia. And, uh, but the area is very small. Now, it is on an architecture which is considered not such a high efficiency architecture in a, in a large area sense. And I'll talk about that in a second. But it holds the record of being the highest efficiency. So it, if you were to extend that and say, hey, that has the highest efficiency in the world, so I should make all the solar cells on that architecture, probably get burned. Right. That architecture in practice is only 20% at large areas. OK. So, uh, so why isn't the efficiency 100%? Because nothing in nature is. Right. The question is why. So a very simplistic answer to that is the following. You use typically in a semiconductor material to absorb uh, solar light. And the band gap is the real key uh, intrinsic parameter that you vary to actually maximize your efficiency. So what happens actually when you increase the band gap of the material? When you increase the band gap of the material, there's a lot of lower energy photons that you're not absorbing. Right? That's the long wavelength uh, photons. So that's one inefficiency. Now you say, OK, so if I want to capture the entire spectrum of solar, I should have a really small band gap material. That way, most of the energy is above the band gap and gets absorbed. And you get infrared. Well, there's one problem with that. That is that uh, you have a lot of excess energy in the conduction band, right? uh, because your band gap is so small. So if you have a lot of excess energy, it will thermalize really rapidly and use, lose energy that way. Right? So you can see that there's an optimum band gap. In one side, you want to absorb more photons. The other side, you don't want to thermalize as much. So there's an optimal band gap. And this is where the tandem cells shine, because they used different band gaps to optimize each one of those properties. And that's why the efficiency is high. Okay? So there's a clear trade-off between thermalization loss and photon loss. And this is actually. Uh, well illustrated in the next slide. I want to make a point that today, 90% uh, of the world market is focused on silicon, right? Silicon is the technology. Just like in the semiconductor, they used to say that gallium arsenide is, will always be the technology of the future. Right? So I think this is, this is also uh, true for silicon. There was a time about two, three years ago where there were serious doubts that silicon would actually keep up with cadmium telluride and SIGs coming in. And it turned out that this dramatic erosion that occurred in polysilicon just threw everything else out of the market. Cadmium telluride. Cadmium telluride still holds about 8% of the market, but it's not going to be for long. Yeah. I mean, again, this is more of a business question, but the SunTech uh, Sun bankruptcy. Yep. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because I mean, you have this like behemoth silicon company that came in and then pushed a lot of these other startups out. Right. And now is like folding. Yeah. So. Yeah, it, it's. It's pretty brutal out there. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's brutal from the standpoint of the shakeout. Uh, but from consumer point of view and the future of solar, it's brilliant, right? Because what's happening is that the costs are dropping so dramatically, then the market is picking up tremendously. I'll show some, some, some plots in there. But with respect to SunTech, you know, the bottom line is that if you can't meet that uh, cost, essentially, and they have pretty much run-of-the-mill technology, right? And uh, um, if you can't meet it, you can't compete with that. Essentially, that would cause you to fail, right? A the, the, lot of problem here uh, it occurred because of the oversupply, right? And the loans that they took, uh, essentially, from, uh, from the government, essentially, and defaulted. Something in particular, they also had some Germany, the US, something that But a lot of these Chinese companies, they got a lot of loan 
and they defaulted on it because there's such oversupply that, that they can't sell them. Or if they're selling them, just wrapping money around it and selling them, right, basically. Because there's just selling them on losses, essentially. Right? Okay, so, um, so essentially this is the spectrum that I was talking about. Uh, you can see that silicon is at that dashed line over there, right? So the red is uh, lower energy than the band gap of silicon doesn't get absorbed, right? And then that's one of the inefficiencies. And the second inefficiency is that all this excess energy, the blue, uh, is thermalized right away. Now, if you were to move uh, to higher band gap, uh, like gallium arsenide, then you would reduce the amount of excess energy, right, because your band gap is higher, but you would actually get incur more of the losses uh, by not absorbing um, the higher, uh, higher wavelength photons. So you can see, depending on the spectrum curve, there would be an optimum, right? Okay. So what happens if every photon above the band gap was converted to an electron? By the way, I go till 5.30. Good. Okay. All right. It's hard to do math when you're actually talking. Okay. So basically, if uh, every photon above band gap is converted to an electron, which is called internal quantum efficiency, uh, is of 100%, then what is the maximum current as a function of band gap? Right? So this is the curve which actually plots that. Ignore the red curve for a second. Let's concentrate on the blue curve. What you see is that as band gap increases, uh, the amount of current that you collect. Does it make sense? Should reduce, right? OK. Just wanted to check if everybody's awake. But, uh, and then essentially, uh, so, so gallium arsenide silicon is here. Gallium arsenide is at 1.42. And you can see for silicon, essentially the maximum, if you con collected every photon above the band gap of silicon, you would get 44 milliamps per centimeter square current. That's the absolute maximum that's possible. So going in, in light of the discussion that we just had, why not go to germanium? Yes? Excellent. Yeah, the thermalization part actually gets here, which is the voltage. Right. So. OK, so essentially, this is that optimum we've all been, you're just you're dying to see. You know, I know from your faces, I can tell you're just dying to see this curve. But basically, this is the maximum efficiency as a function of uh, the band gap, right? And, uh, um, and you can see, actually, it turns out that 1.42 EV for gallium arsenide is very close to the optimum. OK. It just happens to be really expensive material, unfortunately. All right, so that's where it stands. And the maximum efficiency for gallium arsenide is 33. Depending on who you ask and how you calculate, the maximum theoretical efficiency in silicon varies. Probably not in nature, but it varies from 28, 29, 29 and a half to 32 percent, right? Some people use Shockley quasar limit, which is a thermodynamic way of calculating it. Other people use other methods. But the bottom line is that one of the, one of the discrepancies come from the fact is, what is band gap? Right? And when does a lead light stops getting absorbed? Because you guys probably know that light also gets absorbed below the band gap to some extent, right? So where is that cutoff? There is really no real cutoff, right? Two photon absorption, multiple photon interaction, all sorts of things happen. OK, so anyway, now I'll, I'll transition to very quickly uh, module efficiency versus cell efficiency. When you put a cell in the module, you lose efficiency. It's as simple as that. And this loss is about 2 to 3%. Right? Where does this loss come from? Number one, the packing density. Right? You have a certain area. You can't pack uh, these cells without having any gaps in them. And primarily because the gaps occur, this, these cells are not, most of the time, they're not full squares. They're pseudo squares, they're the chamfered edges, essentially. So you'll see a diamond shaped gap in there. The second is that you are now connecting them with strings, and there's going to be I square R losses, the power losses. That affects what's called a fill factor, which is dependent on the resistance of the cell. And finally, you put, encapsulate that in the glass, and so there are some uh, parasitic losses that doesn't allow the light to be coupled, and you lose some efficiency there. OK? So how many of you are going to go run back and look at the spec sheet for sun power in Yingli? Probably nobody. Anyway, but basically, if you were to do that, then this is what you'll find. Um, 
There's something called front contact cell and a back contact cell, okay? So this is a multi-crystalline cell that you see. Typically, a module is a 60-cell panel. That's the standard in industry. It's one of the few standards in this kind of cottage industry. Um, but basically, uh, the, the monocrystalline cell tends to be black, and you see those diamonds there? That is the, what I was talking about is one of the inefficiencies in packing. And this is a sun power cell, which is all black, because both the contact space and emitter on the back, whereas a typical cell, which is a front contact cell, has, you can see the lines in here, the silver lines. Okay. Um, let's see if I wanted to say anything about this. Okay, then there is another concept which dictates uh, CTM, which is cell to module conversion. I hope now everybody knows what CTM is, right? Uh, it's white sheets or back sheets. So essentially, you can have a back sheet on the back or the white sheet on the back. White sheet is more reflective. So the light, which is actually goes here, goes out, hits the glass, gets back in, so you don't lose everything in here. So how white sheets are higher efficiency, but black sheets look better. So depending on who's making the call in your spouse system, you know, you'll choose either a black sheet or a, or a white sheet. Right? OK, so, so essentially, you've got 2 to 3% loss in the commercial modules that you see between cell to, to module. This is the uh, commercial scale module efficiency, not cell efficiency. So you can see how it has ramped from 2008 when we were just starting our business. Uh, crystalline silicon, three curves, thin film, mono and multicrystalline. So let's focus on the blue, which is the monocrystalline. It was about 14, 14 and a half percent, right? Today at 2013, it's about 17 percent module efficiency. And it is projected to go to 19 percent. So uh, sun power, on the other hand, uh, leads the pack in terms of efficiency, 20.1 here, and they also demonstrated 21.2 percent efficiency module. The cell is 23 and a half to 24 percent. This is Gen 3 sun power cell. And we forecast uh, at a module efficiency in 2014 at 20 percent uh, and uh, 22 percent in 2016. Uh, we are current status is we're close to about 19 percent, so we're already ahead of the most of the pack. And uh, what is more dramatic about our technology is that cost uh, it beats any of these costs on this map. You know, so so that's uh, what's unique about Selexel. I hope to get some time to talk about that. Yeah. Go ahead.